Well, Jason, thanks again for meeting up with today. Hey, I always Chris. enjoy hanging out with you. Uh, it's a fun. Yes. It's great stuff. We're on uh, Leading a Serving Podcast, episode number 18. Yeah. Moving right along. Right. I love this. This is fun. I know. I know. We got a we got a fun interview coming up here in a little while. Yes. But uh, in the meantime, I got a question for you. Okay. Um, and I think is this I know one of those things you're gonna put me on the spot again. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. But it's fun. It's <laughs> nothing. Nothing deep or I'm not significant get in about trouble. this whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> are you a um, uh, Are you a penny pincher? Okay. Very frugal. Yeah. Afraid. You know. You, Big big purchases are not your thing, or you like to spend. You like to buy the big toys. You like to do the things, and um, you know. So the question is, which one are you? And uh, if if it was cheap enough, the prices are right. What would you pull the trigger on today? Well, I'm probably <laughs> not the penny pincher. I'm probably the guy that spends on the bigger things. Um, I don't do a lot of small stuff, and my wife would tell you that I'm probably. Buy too much big stuff. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, it's always a problem around Christmas time. They're like, what do you want? I'm like, I don't know. I could use a new car. Yeah. No, yeah. no I don't really say that. But, you know, it's like. <laughs> the, that's their, where your brain goes. In their eyes. That's, I'm with you on that. That's what. Yeah. That's what they're, you know, they're like, dad, everything you want is huge. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, sweetheart. I Sorry. Know. Like, I, know. I'm just, it, it, I, I don't know. But yeah, yeah, so I guess, um, but I also know that uh, there's times where I feel like I start pinching pennies. And right. then, especially after I bought something big like that, like, <laughs> I mean, I haven't bought a new car, don't get me wrong. But um, uh, I know there's times where I'm like, ooh, right, not raining it real quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I'm definitely, a, you know, hey, let's... Uh, you know, let's go buy this and we'll figure out how to pay for it later. Kind yeah. Of, you know, kind of person. Um, <laughs> thankfully, you know, my wife is very strong on the other side of the spectrum. Good. Um, you know, and then I've, you know, I've spent most of my career in, um, you know, nonprofits uh, mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, budgets are, you know, not always, you know, I've had the, you know, uh, you know, I've had some really good budgets over the years. Right. Um, but, you know, it's always... It's nonprofit. It's, just, it's right. still a finite amount of funds, and you never know what needs are coming up. And right. so I've learned to be a penny pincher. I I love researching things and you know getting the best deal for my money. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean if, yeah. if I had a chance today, you keep saying new car, but yeah, you know, I've always wanted a I've always wanted a truck. Yeah, you know I had it. A truck was my first car. Do you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah, had a little Chevy S10. And, okay. Uh, um, and it didn't last long, unfortunately. Uh, really. That. Um, um, if I remember the timeline correctly, my uh, my dad's company that he worked for um, basically uh, went bankrupt, gave him a two week notice. Oh wow! <laughs> and so I got degraded from my my cool little truck to uh, uh, some kind of yeah you know, like seventy nine Buick Skylark or something <laughs> like that. So, <laughs> so I've always wanted to get back in a truck, right? Um, you know, so if I if I could, that's that's yeah. And you know, it's funny. I I started in a truck too. I had a Ford Ranger. My buddy had an S ten though. And, uh, but now I, I wouldn't probably tell you, I'd probably go buy a new truck too, if I could, yeah. but they're crazy prices right now. So, okay, so when we get done with the podcast, where are we headed? Are we going to, I don't know. We can go cruise some car lots in a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And realize that we can't afford them and just kind of right. move on. Yeah. yeah. So well, let's move on. You want to move? Yeah. Since we got onto the trucks, we, we should just move on. So. Okay. <laughs> We want to talk today a little bit about a leadership tool called um, uh, calling up versus calling out. Okay. Um, that as we think about our leadership, um, and this is this is super applicable whether you're in a business and you're leading a business, or you're mm -hmm. leading a nonprofit, or you're leading your family, mm -hmm. or even a friend group. That right. um, you know, a healthy leader is one that um, you know pours into other people. Mm -hmm. who is fighting for the highest good of someone else. That's the purpose of this podcast that we keep talking about is, you know, to truly lead what someone is to truly serve them. Mm -hmm. And so as we do that, we want to, we want to liberate people. We want to give right. them the freedom to, to learn who they are and become leaders in their own right. And, right. you know, that we value their success in, in their sphere of influence too. And so, mm -hmm. um, but unhealthy leadership is either out for yourself you yep. know, that I need you to do something because it benefits me. Right. Or I need you to not do something because I just want to keep you down. Right. I'm I'm against you. Yeah. 
And so that's the type of difference that we're talking about when, um, when you're working with people, when you're leading them, when you're serving them, a uh, difference between calling up and calling out. Mm-hmm. So when you call someone out and you are correcting a behavior or you're pointing them toward a goal or something like that, and you call them out, um, if you feel like you can w- wag your finger at them mm-hmm. <laughs> while you're saying you need to, or you always, or you never, you know, if, if your phrasing starts like that, you're probably calling them out. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a dominating type of language. It's a dominating type of culture that you create, mm-hmm. um, a culture of fear. Right. Um, and you might, I mean, you might get some immediate results. You know, mm-hmm. if you're dealing with employees and, you know, man, you really screwed that one up last time. I need you to do this this time and I need you to get it right. Mm-hmm. They'll probably get it right that time. Right. You know, and a couple more times. But right. does that type of language and leadership create lasting change within your organization. Right. Within uh, your culture. I don't think it does at all. Yeah. And and your employees, your you know, the people around you start to start to fear. Right. You know, they don't they don't know what's gonna happen next. You know, if I if I did that wrong, then mm-hmm. are you gonna come down on me again? Mm-hmm. Um but the language of calling up is where we are um Building people up toward that goal, toward that result that we're seeking in them. Um, you know, like I, um, I was working with a team the other day talking about this very tool and use the example of, you know, if you've got, <laughs> you've got teenagers, mm-hmm. uh, do they ever have to wash the dishes at home? Yes. 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 And it's nice when they use soap. Right. Yeah. It's kind of critical. It is. In the process. <laughs> Minor detail. <laughs> right. And so a calling out would be like, you never use soap. Look at this dish. This is horrible. Do you want to eat all that? You know, right. these are the types of language that that yeah, they'll probably use soap again. You know, the next few times. But did it really shift their mindset? Did it really shift how they how they serve the family through mm-hmm. that? And so, a calling up language would be, you know, hey, I want you to look at this dish. You know, what what do you see on this? Mm-hmm. Okay, I you see the deficiency here. How do you think that occurred? Right. How can we be better? How can we work toward a greater good? And if we don't, what what's the downside of this? Right. You know, well, now we're risking disease and sickness and yeah, it's just kind of gross. Right. <laughs> you know? And there's that. <laughs> and then there's that. Um, you know, and so the calling up is to, you know, how can I build into this person mm-hmm. um, a, a shift in their mindset, a shift in their thinking of, um, you know, is is it a skill that they lack? Is it a, a just a conviction that they lack? And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, calling up builds people better. Yep. Calling out tends to push them down. And that's that's a very important distinction in our language. It's interesting that you commented when you, and you were discussing about it, it. You said something about when you were dealing with somebody, it was dealing with a fear of maybe they were going to affect the leader or... And then you create a fear in them. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I didn't, I hadn't seen that before. I hadn't yeah. thought about that before. But it is totally true in the fact that it is that fear-driven mentality, that negativity without leading up is just, it, it's, it is not, there's not, that's not a positive way to, to lead by any stretch. And so right. doing it the way you were talking about, which is, you know, addressing the issue, but also um, helping somebody become their very best. Mm-hmm. It's just an awesome opportunity. And I think it's, and fear isn't part of it. Right. You know, I right. want, I want the best for you. Like you want the best for me and we want to do that together. And, mm-hmm. and it's just, there's no fear in that. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and so we have to be super intentional as leaders mm-hmm. that, um, you might just be tired yeah, one day. I was going to say, there's... you might you might be hangry, right? <laughs> you know, um, something else may have happened in a whole other realm of your life, right? That you just we just accidentally lash out at somebody mm-hmm. and we we call them out for something that just ticked us off, or you know, we just don't ha- I just don't have the patience for that today, right. so I'm just going to nip it in the bud. I'm going to deal with it right now. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be very intentional to recognize those patterns in ourselves and pour into that positive side of you know I. I want to call people up mm-hmm. into a higher good for them, for us, for our organization. Right. This benefits everybody, not just suits my emotional need at the moment. Yeah, it's very short-sighted to think of it any different, I feel like, um, to, to not focus on so much better things that can happen versus just mm-hmm. this is affecting my world this way. Right, right. So, so 
So there you go. Well, I, I appreciate hope, that, Jason. I hope we find the challenge to call people up today in our language and mm-hmm. what we're, you know, what we're seeking the highest good for them. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I am excited because we are getting ready to talk to a rock star leader. Yeah. Um, and you want to introduce her today? Absolutely. Um, Nancy Bonson is going to be joining us. She is the director of Children of Hope Preschool. Um, they operate out of New Hope Church. Um, so I've had the opportunity to serve on staff with Nancy for nine and a half years mm-hmm. um, through the church and through Children of Hope and um, just some really cool, um, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that our journeys crossed mm-hmm. um, in life together. And uh, and her husband plays bass on our worship team. And so I get to do a little, you know, get a little music with them. Uh, awesome. But great family and a great leader, a great story behind Children of Hope. And so I'm looking forward to diving into this. All right, well, let's take a break and come back and chat right. with her. See you in a minute. Thank you, Nancy Bonson, for uh, joining us today. Okay. We're super excited to chat with you and get to know you better. I know you are a very busy lady, so we will get right to it. <laughs> Give us a little bit of background about Nancy Bonson and where she grew up, where she started, and Give us a little insight into you. Um, sure. I grew up in Rochester, Indiana, northern Indiana. Um, got married and settled in Indianapolis area because that's where my husband's from. Uh, two kids, 28 and 26. Um, hmm. <laughs> I am a licensed teacher. However, I only taught in a classroom for one year. That's a little bit of trivia. Okay. Um, I got into the preschool world and as my kids say, I have never graduated. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's why I'm still here. <laughs> and enjoying every minute of it. I right? do. I love it. I love the kids. Got it. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And so you have, um, under the, you went through, uh, college for teaching. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. But secondary license in math, believe it or not. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. I taught for one year. <laughs> got, <laughs> I, I got pregnant, and my husband and I had decided long before that okay. when we had children, I would stay home. And so I stayed home until that child went to preschool, and I went with her, and I'm still there. <laughs> still there. That's awesome. <laughs> but you've also used your math education in other ways mm-hmm. um, because your husband owns his own business, right? Yeah, and I do run that business from our home. Right. And so you, oh. you help with the books and the financial side. And I do like all that, of right? that. Yes. Right. I deal with the customers and um, accounting and government and right. all that fun right. stuff. All that fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. tell, us, tell us a little bit about Brady's business just so we have a little context. Sure. He does paintless dent repair. So any door dings, hail damage, things like that. He is your guy. He owns his own business. He's his only employee. Okay. Um, I am the CFO, <coughs> it says on the paperwork anyway. That's right. Um, so we're a team, <laughs> nice. and uh, he's been doing that since 95. Uh, Very cool. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So right. um, so I'm curious, you know, you, teaching's in your blood. That's part of, part yes. of who you are, um, you know, but you've got, you know, the other side with your family and, and things like that. But when you went into preschool with your daughter, mm-hmm. you never left. Right. What... Um, was your teaching degree specifically for preschool or was... No, it was secondary. I was high school. High school. Mm-hmm. So why the shift to the little people? Um, initially, it was because I wanted to be where my kids were. Mm-hmm. And so um, when my daughter went to preschool, my son was a baby and I had the opportunity to go and I was kind of like the custodian and I would keep my son with me and vacuum and clean bathrooms and whatever they needed me to do. Um, and it just gave me the ability to be with my kids. Mm -hmm. And so um, Mm -hmm. when then my son was old enough to go to preschool, then I became a teacher and was hung out in the classrooms and um, found out that I had a love for preschoolers that I didn't know was there. (laughs) So so that's, you know, I went into secondary because I thought I wanted to work with older kids and Mm -hmm. um, deal with people who could, you know, you could have an intelligent conversation with Mm -hmm. and found out that preschoolers just broke my heart. I loved them. They were so cute and fun and I just, again, never left. <laughs> that that is cool. There's definitely a difference, a huge difference between those, Absolutely. Two, <laughs> those two ages. Yes. And so I, it's awesome that you were able to use that time to grow for you. Mm-hmm. And then so what? where did you go from there next? Like you went 
and became a teacher. Mm-hmm. What's the process that got you to further down the road to where your point, where you, you're um, running? Yeah. While I was in the classroom teaching, uh, we, at the preschool where I was working, we had an administrative opening. And the lady who was the director at the time came and personally asked me if I would be interested in the position. And I told her no, because I felt like I was supposed to be a teacher. This mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. what I felt like I was supposed to be since I was a little girl. So I thought, no, I'm supposed to be in a classroom. And so I turned her down flat and kept waking up at night and kept thinking about it. And um, so I went back to her and I said, well, let's talk about it. Uh-huh. I want to hear more about the the opportunity. And just knew this is exactly where I was supposed to be. Really? So I said, okay, and um, ended up transitioning into the office. Um, and so that's how I learned some administrative things was by her mentoring. She was a fantastic mentor, um, good person, and I learned a lot from her and, and found that then I not only had the kids that were, you know, the 12 kids or so that were in my classroom, I mm-hmm. now had a whole school of kids plus their parents plus the staff. So God just opened this huge door that I didn't, in my mind, see before. So right. it was just a brand new opportunity. That's so cool. what, what does that, like that responsibility shift is probably was a huge step mm-hmm. in my guess in your stepping stone mm-hmm. of, of life going from focusing on your classroom of kids versus a school of kids. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what do you, what did you feel in that time frame and trying to recognize the impact that you were making shifting from this to that? Um, it took a while actually to realize I bet. It, it it was a lot of new. Mm-hmm. And so it I was blessed when I realized the shift. Um, at first, I was very sad. I missed the interaction with the kids in the every moment of the day until I sat back and realized I was having conversations with parents that I couldn't have otherwise. I was having conversations with um, some of the staff in situations that they were in that I wasn't having otherwise. And I just, I could see more opportunities presenting themselves. And that's that's where I started to, to shift over to, oh, I really get this and I really like this and, and this is a good place for me. So. And did you, in that time frame, did you recognize how much like, yeah, you might directly not be with the kids, but your effect was the leadership that you were giving was trickling down to the kids as well. Had you recognized that? Um, it took a while Did it? to, to see that because, uh-huh. again, I, I knew I didn't have um, that every moment interaction with the kids. And so right. it didn't feel like I had the that influence. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're standing in the hallway and the kids come running to you for a big hug, it, uh-huh. that's when I was like, oh, they're still seeing the, the joy and the happiness and they, they want to, we were, we're interacting still. Right. Um, it was different. Yeah, it was different. Don't, d- don't get me wrong. It was very different, but, um, it was a, it was a good switch, mm-hmm. a good transition, if you will. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm curious some of the, I know you to be a person of stories. <laughs> so I'm curious, some of the stories in those early preschool days or, mm. you know, whether it's working with the kids in the classroom or having conversations with parents, you know, some of that realization process you were just talking about. Mm-hmm. What are some of those early stories that just caused you to fall in love with this preschool age and their families? Being put on the spot, I'm having trouble. Um <laughs> The one that transitioned me to Children of Hope is the one that stands out. Um, One of my jobs in the office as an administrator was to answer the phones a lot. And so I was talking to a lot of parents looking for preschools. And those conversations usually end up coming down to finances. Mm -hmm. That's that's a very real (laughs) answer. Um, And where I was before, there was a financial... It, it, it could be seen as a burden for some families. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I had no recourse other than to say, well, I hope you find what you're looking for. Have a great day, click. Um, and it was breaking my heart to have these conversations with parents. And this was, for me, life-changing. Um, I would sometimes even hang up the phone with tears in my eyes going, I can't continue to do this. I can't answer these questions for these families mm-hmm. and have no option for them. It, mm. it was breaking my heart. 
And um, I started looking for either, I wanted, sounds awful, but I was looking for either harden my heart to this because I cannot continue to do this. It it was Mm -hmm. too heartbreaking. Or I need to move. I need to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was, for me, life-changing in that um, in my home life, we had just moved to the area where Children of Hope is now located. And um, this church had become our church home. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, There was not a preschool here. There was no talk of having a preschool here. Um, Yet this was our new church home. And so just started praying, not necessarily to start a preschool here, just praying, God, I don't know what to do. I I cannot continue in this situation. And um, through some friends, through um, just seeking answers to that, ended up having a conversation with the pastor and the conversation kind of went like this. There is um, an area in this community for folks who cannot afford preschool at all that that's taken care of. There are multiple preschools in this area for families that can go wherever they want to go. They can mm-hmm. make they can go around and look at all the preschools and make the choice that's best for their family. It doesn't matter financially, they can go there. Right. I said, what I'm seeing that's missing in our community is the bubble the people that are in between those two mm-hmm. two graphics. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's what needs to change. And that's why I'm sitting in front of you, is I would like to, to talk about that. Um, four hours later, <laughs> we, <laughs> we sat and hashed out and talked, and, and really hashed out is the word. Um, what would that look like? How would that happen? And um, about eight months later, Children of Hope Preschool became a thing. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. That is neat. So to to reach into that bubble uh, between the two groups, mm-hmm. um, what had to be different about Children Hope to be able to work in that space? There had to be financial support, to be quite mm-hmm. honest. Um, the From the families or from outside sources? Outside sources. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. Most preschools, wherever they're located, whether it be in a church or in its own building, it's a money-making thing. Mm-hmm. That's It's one of the reasons that facilities like to host preschools, because they make money mm-hmm. off of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the first mindset that had to change, <laughs> is this was not going to be a money-maker <laughs> for mm-hmm. our facility at all. Um, and this facility seemed to understand that and want to come alongside and they understood that there was this gap in our community and mm-hmm. that it we needed to figure out how to help with mm-hmm. those families and um so the new hope church then right now financially and has been doing it since 2008 has helped support these families so that their kids can come to preschool and be successful and and be ready for kindergarten mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was, I'm just curious, so mm-hmm. with your math background, mm-hmm. was that a little bit of a struggle? Like like to recognize that, hey, I got to try to make, we got to bring some money in. We're going to have expenses. We know we have overhead. We need help. We have, we're going to end up having employees. Like mm-hmm. that's... Making a budget when your budget shows a deficit as you're making a budget. Yes. Is very foreign. Yes. <laughs> it's not right. Any any financial person would look at that and go, no, 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 no. no You're doing it not, wrong. Right. <laughs> but we knew what the goal was. Right. And the goal was very different. And um, especially at the beginning, had two very smart financial person people that um, came alongside and helped us to figure out this is this is what's going to look like. This is how we're going to handle it. These are and we tried to be very frugal and tried to right. be very good stewards of the money that was given to us um, mm-hmm. for that reason, because we knew that what we were doing was asking for a lot of money, and it, right. and it, and it was a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, but here we are 15 years later. I was going to say, 2008, yeah. that was a little while ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we started in 2008. So, And kind of a cool story with that is um, when we <coughs> we were getting ready for it, and, you know, we started in January of 2008. We started school in August, 
and um, kind of about May, we didn't have very many kids signed up, and it's one of those where you start going, well, maybe this isn't going to work. Maybe I had the wrong thought. Maybe, you know, you start doubting everything. Mm -hmm, Um, And I don't know if you remember, but June 7th of 2008 was the year of the flood. That was the day that we had that huge flood in this area. And we Mm. had a lot of homes just north of here who were, they were devastated. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a community just up the road, too, that was completely devastated. Well, guess what? Those families needed preschool. And they didn't have any money because they just lost everything. Right. And it was one of those where you sit back and go, oh, <laughs> that's why we're doing what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. And we ended up with two classrooms worth of kids from that disaster that happened in June when we started preparing for it in January. Oh, wow. And just wow. kind of mind blown that that was being prepared for before we even knew there was a problem. Wow. Isn't that cool? Yeah, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that. That's mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can always remember June seventh, two thousand eight was the flood because that. So, two thousand eight, yeah. you had two classrooms going. Mm-hmm. Where are we at year. currently? Um, this year, I have to stop and count one, two. This year, we only have four, um, and okay. that's when we had COVID hit. Mm-hmm. It kind of devastated. Uh, um, what we were doing, which makes sense. I mean, who wants their child exposed to anything like that? So, mm-hmm. um, so we're we're on the. What, what happened um, pre-COVID? What, how many classrooms? Um, our max was six at the time. Okay, because I knew I, I knew that you had you guys were growing yeah. pretty rapidly. Yeah, we're to the point now where with the facility that we have, we could max out at seven. There's kind of a way we share a room with with a class. So okay. Um, yeah. And y'all are shifting this coming school year from a four-day to a five-day. Tell Correct. us about some of the shifts there that are coming down the road. Um, yeah. We have never been open on Friday because uh, New Hope Church is traditionally closed on Fridays. It's it's the day off. Um, and, but what we're finding with our families is they're looking for more care. Um, families need to work more. They need more hours. They need more days and such. So in, again, trying to help the families that are our families here, um, we decided that we wanted to go to five days. So we are offering um, five-day classes for our pre-K kids. Um, And then our three-day class used to be um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Next year, it's going to be Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. So it's still three days, just a different three days. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we've, for the the littler kids, we have the option of a two-day class now, which is new. We've never had a a two-day, so they can come on Tuesday or Thursday. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, so there's another surprise along the way that, you know, kind of like the flood, Mm -hmm. that here you start preparing for something, and in June you're like, oh, these are the families, these Mm -hmm. are the kiddos that we're supposed to impact. Um, But along the way, you guys have found a reach into um, a whole different culture down here on the south side of Indy. Tell us about that. Yeah. um, Our second year of preschool, I got a family or a call from a family and um, the lady tells me that she's a host family for um, a family that just got here from Burma. Okay. I didn't know anything about Mm -hmm. this community. I knew nothing about what she was doing. She just said that they just got here. They want, she wanted to bring the little boy to preschool. He knows zero English. Would we be willing? Sure. Why not? Why not? Let's yeah. Yeah, we don't know anything about that, but we'll figure it out too. So this little boy comes to preschool, um, and his backstory is was amazing to hear um, what his family had been through and why they were here. And again, broke my heart <laughs> um, as happens. And um, through this family, then you know, met another family, and then met another family, and. Um, Today, our population is 70% plus students from Myanmar. So God has, has really taken that first step of this little boy whose host family was just looking for someplace where he could learn English mm-hmm. to this, this group of people. They're the demographic we've been looking for is what it comes down to. Mm. They're... they're employed, they're making money, but they're not going to be able to go wherever they want to go. So they fit exactly what we've been trying to do here. Um, and it's been crazy because no, if you'd asked me in 2008, 
what we would look like today, I would have never told you that we would have 70% of our students being refugee families. Mm, No. And how many many of them come in that can't speak English? Um, It depends. Um, At the beginning of the school year, I would say maybe only 25% of them have no English skills. Okay. Um, most of them, because the, we call them dual language learners, they're okay. so little that, the, yes, they're learning English, but they're also learning their home language. Right. Uh, if, if you think about it, I mean, three-year-olds are still mm-hmm. learning English. So we call them dual language learners. So that's where most of our students are. They're at that dual language. Now, because this community has now been established here in America for so long, we do get kiddos that they speak English just like all the rest of the kiddos. So okay. um, we've... There's a wide variety of, okay. of what we get. What is the difficult part is when the parents are not speaking English because it's hard to communicate with them what's going on. And, mm-hmm. and just, you know, school starts at 10, 10 o'clock. Here, let me write that down <laughs> because they're not understanding the English. So okay. that, that's the real challenge. The kids pick it up. That's not a problem. It's the adults that. Yeah, those pliable minds. Yes. <laughs> I wish I could learn ing- languages like they do. but So... You keep using the phrase, it just broke my heart. Mm-hmm. And so I know another thing that that you have just felt like your heart is broken over is for these parents too. Mm-hmm. And so you've taken it even a step further, mm-hmm. right? What? How, how do you reach out and help these parents as well? Do you see that one of the things that, that I do in life is there's a need. Okay, how do we fill that need? That's yes. that's that's kind of how I go about life. And yes, there was a need, definite need of these families. Um, you know, not, they couldn't talk to me about, you know, their child had a nightmare last night and had a bad night's sleep. And so, mm-hmm. you know, this is why my child's crabby. That, things that most parents would tell a teacher, they can't communicate that. Um, they don't know how to fill out a check. The, the payments, they need help with, with how do I even do that? Well, you can't communicate those life skills if you don't have the common language abilities. And so... With that, um, when it first started, I contacted the Chin Community Center and said, hey, um, this is a need that I'm seeing. Do you mind if we come over and do English lessons? And they, yes, please. And so that's where it started. Um, We started going over to the Chin Community Center using some of their resources, um, which they were happy to share with us, Mm -hmm. and just started doing classes. Um, I had to take some classes, too, because I didn't know how to do any of that. So I um, was able to get some certifications in that area beforehand. But, um, yeah, so we started over there. They then got their traction at the Chin Community Center of what they were doing. And very kindly, it was a amicable step away, but they are now doing their own. Um, okay. they, they have their own way of doing things there, which is fantastic. I'm glad that they have that ability. I was also, though, still seeing here the families that were coming to Children of Hope. I was still seeing some difficulties. And so we just said, hey, do you want to do some? You're dropping your child off at preschool. Do you want to stay and learn English? Yes, please. So um, we started doing that. So we have, um, right now, we have about 15 students that stay in the morning. So they're, they're moms who drop their child off, and then they stay for classes. And then we also have classes in the evening. Um, these are more of the dads. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and they're working during the day, and then they come to classes in the evenings. And um, we have a couple of different curriculums that we're working on. We have lots of teachers that come and help. Um, we provide child care in the evening, we, well, actually in the morning and in the evening for the families to come because that's a need. Again, you mm-hmm. see a need, right. and you, you yeah. say, how do I do this? So we've been doing um, ESL classes, let me think, I think we started in 2016 is when we started doing them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, when we think about um, a little bit more of the business side of things, Mm -hmm. you've got a, you've got a paid staff, Mm -hmm. you know, you hire, you fire, you do all of the, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, things that businesses do when it comes to the preschool, but these ESL classes, those are volunteer driven, right? Correct. So you are recruiting and leading volunteers as well as paid staff Mm -hmm. and training them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is, uh, that's a huge challenge because those, they're, they're more dissimilar than they are alike, I think in a lot of ways. (laughs) It's different. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, we have to edit this spot because I had a train of thought and now it's gone. Mm. 
I was trying to catch it. Do you have? <laughs> yeah. But I didn't. <laughs> the train, the train's going that way. You're on the wrong side of the tracks, buddy. Uh, <laughs> um, I had something a little more. Were you, were, my guess is, uh, were you going to touch on leadership? Because, I mean, the leadership side of, of running a business oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and leadership of running something where you're strictly volunteer-driven, where's, where's the biggest um, – tell us what you think is the biggest problems between those two because I know there's a big difference between the two. What would you say is the biggest difference between them? Um, <laughs> when you have employees – you you train them as such, and meaning you know I'm the boss. Mm-hmm. I, I asked you to do this. I, I need that to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're working with volunteers, would you please? And if it doesn't get done, then I get to do it. it mm-hmm. you, there there's there's a difference in in how you you handle situations. Um, you know, if a volunteer doesn't show up. I, I follow up, make sure they're okay, um, right. but they're not fired or, you know, the, right. <laughs> let's try better next time type of thing. You know, if a, an employee doesn't show up, that's a problem, and we're going to have a conversation about that. So I guess that's how you um, you handle situations with them. A volunteer is, we're just happy they're helping. thinking about helping. Mm-hmm. Um, and have you found that there's, um, that you have the consistency with your volunteers that you do, mm-hmm. your employees? Actually, I do, um, and awesome. I and I just think that's the caliber of people. Mm-hmm. Um, a volunteer in general, I would think, is not as reliable. Yeah. But in in what we're doing, they really are. Yeah. Um, they're they're good people who who love um, the students they're working with. They love mm-hmm. helping out, and um, they get invested in them. Mm-hmm. And so they want to be there for them as well. So I, really, honestly, it's not a problem. If they're not going to be here, they'll let me know. And I mm-hmm. actually even have people in the background who are saying, hey, if you need help, let me know. I'll be there. Right. So. Well, and I, I, would, I would also add to that that it's probably got to do with some leadership, too. Oh. Because well. I know <laughs> I, you I that, agree that, you know, it's great leadership is a lot easier to follow whether you're paid or not. And we're walking into a generation um, now currently that is getting more and more less driven on funds and getting paid and more about purpose mm-hmm. impact. And, yeah. and impact. So I would mm-hmm. say that, you know, great. I know from my past experience that following great leadership is a lot easier to do. Mm-hmm. Well, thank so. you. I, I, I would say that it's more about, you were saying the purpo- purpose and the, and the passion. And, you know, I said once these teachers – get to know their students there's great purpose and there's great passion for they they love them and they want to help them and they want to be there for them and so um that makes it a lot easier (laughs) (laughs) but it also you know like like we were talking before the show you know i was talking to you about your passion that comes out in you and the way you you know you talk about your purpose and stuff like that Mm -hmm. like in it it uh, i know it just flows out of you because every time i talk to you about children of hope it's amazing how (laughs) much it comes out and it's exciting to be, um, to watch you lead with that. And also I know that other people while they're listening to that also have a tendency to want to get on board because you're passionate about what you do. And Mm -hmm. so, um, what we appreciate you greatly. And, um, but I also, um, and I appreciate you coming here and sharing some of this information, but did you have something else? Sorry. No, you're good. You're good. No, you're perfect. Um, going back to 08, mm-hmm. if um, if you were if, if you had the opportunity to start over, and mm-hmm. you were doing this again, mm-hmm. um, is there anything you'd do a little bit different? Gosh, since it's not pot, I'm not a person who who um, tries to think about changing the past because I know I can't. And so a question like that is something I haven't even considered because I can't go back and change it. So. Right. Um, Maybe can. a lesson learned along the way that you thought, oh, that wasn't quite exactly how I thought it would work out. I would do that again different. Uh, well, there are lots of lessons learned along the way. I mean, we all make mistakes. We all do things that, um, you know, that wasn't the the best way I could have handled that situation. Mm-hmm. There, there are lots of those type of stories. But um, those are things you, you learn from and mm-hmm. you do better next time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a lot of people have asked me, you know, how do you deal with you know, 15 women, you know, that, that 
sounds like a nightmare to a lot of people. And I, I do come back to I have made a lot of mistakes over the years. I, I have made some some decisions that were not um, the best decisions. But then I learn from that. And uh-huh. so the next time I can use that wisdom and mm-hmm. do a better job the next time. Right. Um, and a lot of those type of decisions have come from um, honestly being too compassionate at times of not putting my foot down, of not handling a situation when it needed to be handled mm. um, because I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. And That's I, hard. I try to, to hand, you know, be kind and, and compassionate and, and to hear an individual. However, um, I have learned that I have to consider not only that individual, I have to consider the students, I have to consider mm-hmm. their parents, I have to consider the entire staff, I have to consider the facility and, and the use right. thereof and, and the people who are here. And, um, mm-hmm. So when I make a decision now, it is based on all of those things, mm-hmm. not just that person. And that took me a long time to learn yeah. that that's, I have to look that. You have to focus um, on the greater good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I've had the I've had the honor of knowing you for nine and a half years. Has it been that long? It has. Wow! Like a <laughs> joyful nine and a half years. Right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, as I have observed your leadership and watched you, you know, working here at New Hope, I get to see the kids walking through the hallways on their mm. way to lunch or out at the playground. Um, I get the honor of uh, singing Christmas songs every year um, to you know my. I I love that you guys love preschoolers. They frighten me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They're not for everybody, for sure. Uh, no, I, I love, uh, I get to be there with Santa and sing a couple Christmas songs every mm-hmm. Christmas. You know, it's it, a lot of fun. Um, but what you were touching on there is one of the things that I appreciate about your leadership so much is that um, whenever you make a decision, you're considering a new path, you're you know considering a, a hard situation, whether it's parents or staff or volunteers or, you know, whatever it is, um, I always trust in your decision because I know that you're very intentional about how you reach a decision Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it, you know, it may start with my heart is broken, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, some of, some of your nurture side comes Mm -hmm. into play and going, you know, I've, I've got a, here's a need. I got to fill it. Um, but you are incredibly intentional about how you make decisions, whether that's to start a preschool or it's just to, you know, um, the bus is broken down for a field trip. What are we going to do? <laughs> and so there, there is a huge amount of trust in, in your leadership from my perspective that you're not just doing things accidentally or willy nilly, that yeah. you're very intentional about that. And so I, I love that about you. So well, thank you. And I am intentional. I, I, there are decisions that I, I can't just, Hey, let's try this. Why not? No. Why? Right. Well, let's, let's talk about that. Let's, let's see the big picture of what this, what effect that would have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but that did not come natural. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I've got two things left. One is easy. Okay. Um, oh, actually, both. You're gonna, you'll, you'll definitely love the second one. Um, first thing is, if there's some parents listening mm-hmm. who would love to get connected with a preschool, or maybe it's somebody in the uh, you know, community that's like, I'd, I'd love to help out with ESL, or I'd love mm-hmm. to, you know, just, you know, help. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how do, we, how do they find you? Um, how would they find out information about Children Hope? Um, well, Easy way is to call a church. Um, yep. The Another way would be to go to the website, which is becomehope.com backslash preschool. Um, those are the two fastest, easiest ways. You mm-hmm. um, can always stop by. I'm happy to talk to anybody Absolutely. <laughs> about preschool. Um, I do ask, though, if you're going to stop by, make an appointment so I can make sure I'm available. I'm not talking on a podcast and not available for somebody. Right. Um, right. Just makes it a little easier. Right. Absolutely. All right, and then finally, would you finish us up with one of your favorite preschool stories about one of your kids? Uh, See, I knew you'd like this one. I, I do, but I have to think. It's hard to pick, though, right? I know, right? It's so hard. Um, oh, gosh. I'm trying to... this, uh, when I'm put on the spot, I have trouble even thinking of one. <laughs> hey, <laughs> tell us two or three if you want. Oh. <laughs> uh... Hmm. See, you should have asked me yesterday, and then I'd have one for you today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, seriously. Um, just the things that kids say. Um, they're very honest. They're um, they have no filter, and uh, they're they're um, yeah. And I learned a lot <laughs> from that. But 
Um, having a child, you know, you walk into a classroom and they'll go, why is your hair like that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What is wrong? Um, just, I just love kids for that, that they're very honest. Um, you walking down the hall and all of a sudden you're, you're getting this hug from behind. <laughs> um, what was, what's going on? <laughs> Why is there somebody hanging on me? Um, so just those kinds of fun, fun things. Um, Things that kids say, oh, can never predict. Um, and their understanding of words, sometimes, you know, they get words mixed up. Mm-hmm. And, and so those are always the cute ones where they're, they're thinking it means one thing when, <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and especially with our, our dual language learner students, mm-hmm. they're, they'll hear there's a particular number that in, one of the dialects of Chin means something completely different. In fact, it's a funny word, if you will. And so when you're <laughs> counting with them, they... <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. That's great. So, you know, things like that that we, we just see every day, every moment. So, you know, yes, we get stories that make us laugh, but to, to pick one, I, I, I'm at a loss because they're just... They crack me up all the time. That's That's right. funny. That's great. Well, cool. Well, thank you again for joining us and spending some time. I know you're a busy lady, and I appreciate you sharing your wisdom and and um, all the efforts that you that you lead with, and really appreciate you sharing that with others and now sharing it with us as well. You're welcome. My so, pleasure. Yes, thank you for being here, and uh, thanks for taking the time away from Children Hope. I got to go back to see what they're doing. That's right. That's right. So, well, thanks, Nancy. Mm -hmm. We'll be back with you guys here in a moment. All right, Jason. Well, as always, um, I mean, we are so blessed with a great um, interviewees. um, Yeah. Because it's just... We learned so much. It's so easy to live our life in our community, in our own little bubbles, our own little circles, right. and have no idea the impact. Yeah, that people are bringing all around us it's every day. Huge, so cool. And so I, you know, I was just loved. Uh, and like I've told you before, like I love listening to her because she just, I love her passion for what she does and who she's, mm-hmm. and the and the people she's reaching. It's just amazing. And what yeah. was really cool to hear about was the transition that she went from um, being in a classroom in impacting those kids to impacting a whole school. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is yeah. what a neat transformation, a neat growing opportunity that she just grabbed. The best part about it, she was like, no, I don't want to do that. Right. And then it was like, <laughs> all right, maybe I'll think about this. And exactly. Do, and, and then turning that, you know, around and coming around and trying to find some more information and, and accepting that challenge. Right. right. Just a phenomenal lady, a great leader. Um, yeah. And just, um, it was great to have her today. Sorry, I kind of, do you have any? You want to I loved, that? I loved where she just kept talking about my heart broke over this. Mm. And I felt like I needed to do something about it. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of going back to our previous interview in our last episode about the aughts. I ought yes. to do something about this. Yep. I could do something. You know, maybe God has put me in a place to to speak into this need. You know, mm-hmm. that there's the old saying, I was thinking about this while we were talking with Nancy that you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Mm-hmm. I think Nancy's saying would be where there's a need, there's a way. Right. And so she just jumps in is like, how can we figure this out? How right. can we, you know, and it's not um I mean, she, you know, we talked about how intentional she is and how, you know, she, um, you know, is very intentional and specific in her planning profit process. Right. Um, but, you know, when you jump into a brand new need, it's not going to be pretty. Right. You know, your solution's going to, you know, grow and mature over time and right. things like that. And, you know, when we hit stop, uh, when we hit stop on the recording, um, you know, we asked a little bit more about uh, the language barrier. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's important for people to understand that this isn't just, um, you know, one people group who have one language <clears throat> that there, she said, I think she counted almost uh, 10 or 12 different dialects mm-hmm. of, you know, it's of the same language, but the dialects don't, <laughs> there's not, not the as same. much crossover. Right. And so the way she communicates with one family is different from another family, from right. another family, from another family that, you know... Th- so Where she, there's a need, there's a way. Right. So she's, she's almost dealing with like 
like 10 or 12 different languages nonstop. Absolutely. And it's just amazing. Absolutely. To, to, to even balance that, let alone all the other needs. Right. So we think about challenges in our business as well. We, I could never do that. I could never, you know, there's too many obstacles in the way. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, what Nancy and, and uh, all of her wonderful teachers and leaders and people who have been on the journey with her for years have shown is that, no, there's... There's a way to overcome challenges, right? Obstacles. It's not, it's not insurmountable. Well, and at no point did she ever go. You know what? I don't know that we can do this. We can't. You know, I'm not sure we can do it. After looking into it, it's like, mm-hmm. no. It was like, all right. So how are we going to figure this out? Yeah. Like, what are we going to do? I don't know how we're going to do it. Right. We're, we're going to. We can figure we're, this out. We're going to figure it out. Like, Absolutely. There was no question that there was an end. Like there was, there there was always a. This is the problem. How are we going to fix it? Mm-hmm. And I, I love that about her. That was yeah. great to yeah to listen to. Super good. Yeah. Super good. Well, you guys give us a like. Yes. Give us a you know comment if you're on Apple Podcasts. Yeah. Uh, leave us a review. Um, you know, send us an email if there's something you want to hear. Um, Thanks for joining to us. Hear more about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, been another great day. So I, I think the big takeaway for us today is as you're going through life, you see a need. How can you fill it? Yeah. Let's do it. Y'all have a great day. Thanks. Thanks.